Hi guys, we're back with sessions 33. Now I know in sessions 32 I mentioned ICU care and to some degree um, this is ICU care also but bear in mind that there is ICU care and CCU care is extensive and even with all that we mentioned there's still a lot to learn. I've tried to compile it in just a few short minutes things like invasive monitoring, titration of IV drugs, arterial line and its uses and lethal rhythms. So let's get started. Now invasive monitoring, I'm not going to go too deeply into it simply because ICUs vary and CCUs will vary from one place to the next. Some are more involved in invasive monitoring, others are not are more basic. But invasive monitoring is when you do things like arterial line monitoring, central venous pressure, uh, the PA catheter which used to be known as the Swan-Gans line. And of course, in order to read these pressures, it takes extra training. And you will need someone to guide you through the whole thing. When it comes to the infusion of IV drugs, bear in mind there's some drugs like, uh, I've mentioned a few here, Dobutrex, Epinephrine, Nipride. Some of these drugs are used to enhance cardiac function. Some of them to decrease the blood pressure, increase the blood pressure as the doctor sees fit. So familiarize yourself with some of the drugs that may be used in ICU, how they're titrated. Usually they're titrated according to doctor's specifications. The doctor will decide first of all if a patient even needs to be on such a drug. And bear in mind, like I gave you an example of this patient who has a long-standing cardiac history. He's now in the ICU complaining of shortness of breath on exertion, chest pain, and dizziness, and a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy was made. Such a patient may very readily have a PA catheter inserted and be put on drugs like nitroglycerin, which helps, please excuse my voice, nitroglycerin, which helps to improve uh, oxygenation and decrease the workload of the heart, an antiarrhythmic like amiodarone, which actually can use, be used for either atrial or ventricular rhythms, and morphine sulfate might be titrated in small doses for pain. Now, <clears throat> if your doctor orders meds to be titrated, you're going to need the patient's height, weight, you're going to need to have an IV pump to program it, a calculator maybe, make sure your tubings are new, make sure you check with pharmacy specifically to find out if your drugs are being calculated to the right specifications, that you do not mix the dose wrongly. You make sure that the dose is correct for the amount of IV fluid. And take the time to ask someone to help you out if you don't know what you're doing. It doesn't hurt. Now, an arterial line is often put in place for monitoring the blood pressure invasively because it is in constant contact. It's mon it gives you constant monitoring of the blood pressure. And it's also used in cases where patients are not going to be stuck. You don't want to keep sticking a patient because if you stick them constantly, it, 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 it's painful and destructive to the vein. So if you have an arterial line and you go to the stopcock and draw blood out, but you also need to bear in mind that you have to check to make sure there's no disconnection at site because arterial blood, if you lose a lot of it, can be very dangerous. It's your oxygenated blood. Also, you've got to watch for hematoma formation at the site of the catheter. Take a look at this tracing. It means something is obviously wrong. If your tracing was correct, this is what you would expect. Something similar, you'd see a wave on the monitor. So try to familiarize yourself with these things in order to know exactly what you're doing. Also bear in mind that the zero point for all these lines at the CVP, the PA and the arterial line is called the phlebostatic axis. There is a zero point. This is the landmark where you would be doing it. Let's talk a little bit about sinus arrest. When we speak of lethal rhythms, I know we always make reference to a specific few. But think of the patient who goes into sinus arrest because they had uh, the sinoatrial load was not functioning. What would you expect? Well, an inferior wall MI, which is only one type of myocardial infarction, can potentially cause this kind of problem. Let's take the case of this patient. He's complaining of indigestion, and the nurse medicates him, but she's not, he's not getting any relief. And this is not uncommon with an inferior wall of myocardial infarction because it lies, the inferior wall of the heart lies on the diaphragm. So what do you get? A lot of complaining of indigestion. Be aware if you have a patient who's been complaining of indigestion that's not going away, you've treated it, 
with uh, anti uh, antacids. It's just not going away. Suspect it might be something more involving than just uh, heartburn. So you need to check the vital signs, administer O2, notify the doctor, and don't forget to document your findings. Now we talk about really lethal rhythms. We see ventricular fibrillation, a coarse wavy line, just chaotic activity on the monitor. There is no atrial wave, uh, there's no P wave, there's no QRS. Then we take a look at uh, ventricular tachycardia. You can see that you have that distinct wave, but indeed, you don't, even though it's regular, you may or may not have a pulse. And depending on if you have a pulse, the treatment will be different. If there is a pulse, it's treated differently from if there's no pulse. If there's no pulse, it's treated identical to ventricular fibrillation. Then we have a PEA, which is pulseless electrical activity. In this case, you would expect a patient to have a normal rhythm, PQRS, but if you take a look at this patient, the clinical situation does not match the EKG rhythm. You may very readily have a patient who is not responding. No, no. Um, when you try to uh, get a blood pressure, there's none. Some of the causes, I think, may be hypovolemia being the main cause. Cardiac tamponade, drug overdose can also cause pneumothorax thrombosis and a trauma patient. Normally, what would have to happen you'd have to treat the underlying cause. And then we have a systole, nice P, Q, R, S, and a T, and then a straight line. Now be aware, if you have a patient demonstrating a straight line, you may want to check the leads to make sure they're not disconnected. And then, of course, once you've established that your rhythm is accurate, you check for responsiveness, and you go do what ACLS guidelines in instructs you to do. So I hope you've learned something from this. and. Of course, some of the ACLS drugs are like epinephrine, vasopressin, amiodarone, atropine, magnesium sulfate. Remember, a code is a joint effort. You never code a patient on your own. It's just not possible. So when you call a code, if you have an unresponsive patient, even in intensive care, usually the code team responds. The doctor is there to guide you. Different people find out what your exact assignment is. Are you going to be pushing the drugs? doing the EKG strips, what are you supposed to do? Don't just stand there, do something, find out what your responsibilities are. Can you be of help replacing IV fluids? And this needs to be coordinated with the code team. So I hope you've enjoyed learning. And if you go to dearnurses.com, there's plenty of helpful information on ICU care. Have a great day. And of course, stay posted for more clinical information.